Anime has become a worldwide phenomenon, but have you ever thought to yourself, how did anime even begin? Me either. But I decided to do loads of research on the entire origin of anime anyways. It turned out to be actually really interesting, but also very time consuming. So make sure to subscribe. Apparently over 90% of viewers who tune into my little videos aren't subscribed. So if you enjoy this video, I would really appreciate the support. Anyways, let's get into it. So the history of animation in Japan goes pretty far back. The tradition of entertainment using colorful painted figures moving across a screen in Japan dates back to the 19th century. A particular Japanese style of magic lantern show called Utsushie was popular in the 1800s. But this doesn't exactly count as anime. The first initial generation of prominent animators date back to the 1910s, consisting of Oten Shimakawa, Junichi Kochi, and Satoru Kitayama, commonly referred to as the fathers of anime. But they weren't the first to do it. An old animation consisting of some 50 frames showed up in 2005 in Japan, having never been seen before. There's no information on who made this, but experts estimate it's from 1907. But this still doesn't exactly count as anime. The quote, fathers of anime didn't create a real Japanese anime until 1917 called The Dull Sword. Articles on anime films and small shorts created before this have been noted, but for some reason many earlier Japanese animes didn't survive to see the light of day. So with hard evidence, Junichi Kochi's The Dull Sword is in fact the first real Japanese anime. It was a four minute long silent short that tells of a samurai's foolish purchase of a dull sword. Kochi was a characterist and painter who had also studied watercolor painting. In 1912, he entered the cartoonist realm and was hired for an animation by a man named Kobayashi Shokai in 1916. Many see him as the most advanced animator of the 1910s. As for his other founding fathers, Oten Shimakawa was a cartoonist as well, and did a total of five animations before a medical condition left him inept. Seitaro Kitayama made animations for himself and was never really hired by bigger animation companies. He eventually founded his own studio, which sadly failed due to lack of commercial success. But nonetheless, these were three pioneers. Before the end of World War II, it was common for animators to create propaganda animations for the state of Japan. Japanese authorities urged animators to create these types of works for obvious reasons. Japan was in a time of intense nationalism. Besides the unlucky times these animators were living in, some tried to pursue other goals and create commercial works for the people. Anime in Japan was very hard to sell before the 40s and 50s. Disney was already a goliath at that time that the Japanese animators had to combat against. An interesting thing to note as well is that in Japan, animators hardly ever drew their works but would rather use cutout animation as it was far easier and there was really no need to draw because these animators were making works that they didn't really care about. Animators such as Kenzo Masaoka and Mitsuyo Seo, however, did try to bring up the quality of Japanese anime to that of a foreign level. They implicated cell animation, the art of drawing your animation frame by frame, into their works, as well as using sounds and the best tech for their animes. And lo and behold, Masaoka created the first complete anime with cell animation in 1934. Masaoka and others had been toying around with cell animation and voiceovers for a few years, but finally incorporated it all into one short film and many others over the years. Through the years during the war, Kenzo Masaoka practiced with his animation gift, creating many shorts, all with different methods. Many people claim that his work Spider and Tulip was a legendary animation released in 1943. It was 16 minutes long, which was above average for Japanese anime at the time. It was shown in cinemas across Japan, and it's safe to say people loved it. Two years later in 1945, the Japanese Navy commissioned a propaganda animation directed by Mitsuyo Seo. It was a whopping 74 minutes long and included talking naval animals. A 16 year old boy by the name of Osamu Tezuka saw the movie when it came out and actually cried at its beauty. Tezuka would turn into one of the most influential animators in Japanese history. Tezuka, a year after the war ended, published his first manga titled Diary of Machan, and in 1947 published yet another manga named New Treasure Island. His original work was apparently too long for the publisher, so he had to shave off more than 60 pages, which really hurt his manga. It went from a good manga to a below average one after he took out all those pages. But aside from that, a manga era was born in Japan. Many talented individuals started to write stories and create animation with more skill. The progression of technology was prevalent after the Second World War ended, and in turn we saw many inventions being made, and many animes. In 1946, Masaoka and his team created Sakura Haru no Genso. It was a beautiful black and white anime film, but Toho Animation rejected showing it because they claimed it was too artistic. Ouch. 
And in 1948, Masaoka and his animator friend Zenjiro Yamamoto bought out Japan Animated Films, which was a small Japanese animation studio. With things starting to pick up in anime, many people were allured by this newfound animation concept, so we see the birth of many legendary animators. But contrary to the promising future for anime, Kenzo Masaoka retired from anime in 1950 due to his worsening eyesight. He still continued his drawing career only in different ways. With Yamamoto left alone, a large company in Japan called Toei Company buys out his business. They rename Japan Animated Films to Toei Animation, or Toei Doga to be specific. The 1950s saw a lot of short anime films, but no movie-length feature films, until Toei Animation's Hakuja Den. This movie was an absolute game changer in Japanese animation. It was released to the Japanese public in 1958. It was also one of the first three Japanese anime films to be released in America. Its American name was titled Panda and the Magic Serpent, which came out three years later in the US. This was the first Japanese anime to be full color and to be a full length feature film. And from then on, Toei Animation created a feature film annually. Although we saw Snow White 20 years earlier in America, this still was a pretty big feat due to Japan's unfortunate past circumstances. The 60s saw a lot of progress anime-wise. There were many full-length feature films being made, as well as the introduction of anime TV shows. Instant History was the first Japanese show to include animation. It wasn't a traditional anime, but it was still a first. Through the 50s and early 60s, Osamu Tezuka was pioneering his own ideas for manga and anime. Notably, he released Ambassador Adam in 1952, which gave birth to some future ideas. He also released a manga titled Phoenix. He claimed Phoenix to be his life's work, although unfinished and without an anime adaptation. Tezuka worked with Toei Animation in the late 50s and early 60s, and he stated that he hated it. He felt like his creative freedom was taken away from him. He was director of a new film called Sayuki, which turned out to be a difficult job for Toei and Tezuka. They really didn't get along. But this film was sort of a turning point in anime. It introduced limited animation, the reusing of previous animated scenes to save time and effort. With Tezuka's malice for Toei and a timed out contract, he left and created a rival company in 1961 called Mushi Productions. And in 1963, Tezuka would create Astro Boy, a TV series based on his previous work. This is what blew anime into the sky. Astro Boy was the first fully animated TV show to be premiered on Fuji TV. It also became very popular in the West. From here on, the typical anime style started to develop. No more mimicking Walt Disney. We saw the bigger eyes, the smaller bodies with bigger heads, and things like this emerge in the 1960s. The same year as Astro Boy's release, a young 22-year-old animator with many ideas joined Toei Animation. His name is Hayao Miyazaki. He proved a skilled animator at Toei but left in 1971 to work at A-Pro, where he co-directed a film called Lupin the Third Part 1. Besides the emergence of Hayao Miyazaki, the 60s gave us the first quote, magic girl anime titled Sally the Witch in 1966, as well as an anime called Speed Racer. Speed Racer was a hit in America. Osamu Tezuka's manga Princess Knight also saw an anime adaptation in 1967. This was a heavy influence in Japan, giving off ideas of feminism and a female hero. And I thought this was kind of interesting. A show called Sazai-san started in 1968, and I'm pretty sure it's still airing. It has over 7,000 episodes to date. You remove One Piece? While the 1960s were a great year for pioneering television, the film market was also doing well creating things like Cyborg 009, which was a big hit. Then come the 1970s. The growth of TV's popularity really hurt the Japanese animation world. Mushi production went bankrupt, and things weren't great for Toei either. Many of their employees left the company to pursue TV-centered studios like A-Pro and Telecom Animation. Some employees that left Mushi Productions ended up creating Madhouse and Sunrise Studios. Sunrise would end up creating shows like Code Geass, Mobile Suit Gundam, and Inuyasha, while well, Madhouse would make Death Note, Parasite, and One Punch Man. With all these talented animators leaving their animation studios, the early 70s definitely saw some strain. But in 1970, a boxing anime named Tomorrow's Joe was made and became widely iconic in Japan. And as you may remember, Hayao Miyazaki was among the people to leave Toei Animation in the early 70s. His time at A-Pro was very short-lived. He left the company in 1973 to join Nippon Animation with a man named Isao Takahata. Isao Takahata, who co-directed Lupin the Third Part 1 with Miyazaki, created an anime targeted toward children in 1974. It was called Heidi Girl of the Alps. It was very successful, especially in Europe. 
Miyazaki found fame as an animator on World Masterpiece Theater and as director of TV series Future Boy Conan. He directed his first feature film in 1979 titled The Castle of Cagliostro. The Gundam genre also sought love in the 70s. Shows like Space Battleship Yamato, Mazinger Z, and Mobile Suit Gundam all saw popularity. The US had some stricter censorship in the 70s as well. While showing Gatchaman in the US, they censored the transgender characters on the show, not even allowing them to appear on the screen. And remember how Mushi Productions went bankrupt? Well, they restarted their business six years after they shut it down, so good for them. Overall, the 70s were a hard year for anime, but we also saw many great leaps towards the future. The 80s saw a visual quality renewal thanks to many directors like Miyazaki, Takahata, and a man named Katsuhiro Otomo. The 1980s also saw the rebirth of space-themed shows due to Star Wars popularity. Mobile Suit Gundam was created as a film in 1982, and Space Battleship Yamato was receiving lots of love from the Japanese anime community. It was a highly influential show, having many adaptations made for it and many films. The success of these two shows started what many see as the beginning of the anime boom, and of Japanese cinema's second golden age. Fandoms revolved around these two franchises started a fanbase called otakus. Hayao Miyazaki, Takahata, Toei Animation, and many other animators and studios were working on a revolution in anime. The 80s are extremely important for anime. One of the most influential animes was created by Miyazaki in 1984, called Nasuka of the Valley of the Wind. The success of this film allowed Miyazaki and longtime partner Takahata to create their own studio. They called it Studio Ghibli and busted out Castle in the Sky in 1986. Anime films definitely were making a comeback in the 80s. Many studios were trying to outclass their predecessor films, leading to many more high-budget experimental films like Akira and Royal Space Force The Wings of Hani Amise. These two films were the most expensive anime films ever. Akira was a massive failure in Japan but gave birth to many other ideas. On the flip side, Miyazaki was doing his creative geniusing and in 1989, released Kiki's Delivery Service, the top grossing film in Japan of 1989. On top of the success of anime films in the 80s, we also saw many iconic shows surface as well. Most notably, Akira Toriyama's Dragon Ball. Dragon Ball was created as an anime in 1986 and was massively successful in every aspect. This show was incredibly influential in anime, influencing so many animes you know and love today like Yu Yu Hakusho, One Piece, Naruto, One Punch Man, and many others. With the introduction of VHS in the 80s, animes saw their first OVAs, animes created specifically for at-home viewing. The 1980s paved the way for many modern shows and movies, but 1988 and 1989 saw the loss of Kenzo Masaoka and Osamu Tezuka respectively closing out the 80s era of anime. Rest in peace to the legends. The 90s saw a revival of the super robot genre of anime like Brave X Kaiser in 1990. The success of this show saw rebirths of old 70s super robot shows like Get A Robo Go and Tetsujin 28 Go XF. There were very little popular super robot shows produced after this until Gurren Lagann's massive success in 2007. In 1995, Hideako Anno wrote and directed Neon Genesis Evangelion, a controversial anime at the time. This show became extremely popular due to all the press surrounding its controversy. Anno created this anime in hopes of reviving the dying anime otaku subculture. He attempted to make it the ultimate otaku anime. The culminating success of Evangelion led to a movie adaptation in 1997. It contained many violent and sexual scenes, which led TV Tokyo to tighten their censorship on anime content. Because of this tightened censorship, Cowboy Bebop, which aired in 1998, was heavily edited and showed only half the total episodes. But even with this, it gained huge popularity in both the US and Japan. The same year Hideako Anno released Evangelion, Ghost in the Shell was released as an anime film. This movie was highly influential towards The Matrix and probably other movies as well. Many animes were massively successful in America, like Pokemon, Dragon Ball Z, Sailor Moon, Bakugan, and Digimon. This led to a massive explosion in anime's popularity in the US. Sailor Moon and Dragon Ball Z were dubbed in over 12 languages each. In 1997, Hayao Miyazaki's Princess Mononoke became the most expensive anime film up until that time taking $20 million to create. Miyazaki claims to have personally checked all 144,000 cells in the film and is estimated to have redrawn parts of 80,000 of them. Sheesh! In that same year, the Toonami block on Cartoon Network launched for the first time and contributed to the massive growth of anime in the US as well. The 90s showed great leaps in what anime could be and manga writers and directors were getting better and more talented along with the increase in quality of technology. 
Then come the 2000s. You're all probably pretty familiar with this decade of anime. It was a very good year for anime, with many style changes and new ideas flourishing. This was a notably good time period for the otaku subculture of anime. Many manga and anime started to become less fantastical and more normalized, giving us many rom-coms and slice-of-life animes that we'd never seen before the 2000s. The first late night block on Fuji TV came out, airing shows on Thursdays later at night. The first production shown on this block was the anime Honey and Clover, which was very successful. Fuji TV has been running the block uninterrupted since 2005, and has yielded many successful productions unique in the anime market. Many legendary animes came to fruition in the 2000s as well. To name a few, we have Naruto, One Piece, Death Note, FMA, and its better counterpart, FMAB, Gurren Lagann, or on Host Club. There are so many bangers that came out in the 2000s that it's kinda crazy. The revival of anime feature films from Japan appeared as well, showing films like Metropolis, Appleseed, Millennium Actress, Paprika, and the most expensive of all being Steam Boy, which cost $26 million to produce. Younger film directors like Mamoru Hosoda, director of The Girl Who Leapt Through Time and Summer Wars, also began to reach prominence. In 2006, some graduates from the University of California, Berkeley, launched Crunchyroll, becoming the first anime streaming service ever, a model later used by Netflix, Funimation, and Amazon in the 2010s. Many anime-inspired shows began to arise in the 2000s as well, like Avatar The Last Airbender, Code Lyoko, Ben 10, and Samurai Jack. The 2000s were heavily influential. In 2013, Hayao Miyazaki announced that The Wind Rises would be his last film, and in 2014, Studio Ghibli halted production and Miyazaki retired. His partner Takahata created a comeback film in 2013 called The Tale of Princess Kaguya, which had disappointing sales. This factor could have contributed to the halt in the studio. But either way, anime is as popular as it has ever been with a record 340 anime shows airing on TV in 2015 alone. We've seen so many amazingly beautiful shows come out in the 2010s, like Attack on Titan, My Hero Academia, Demon Slayer, Hunter x Hunter, and so many others. More studios and more talented and creative individuals are showing up, and they're creating some of the best shows with the best art that we've ever seen. Anime is now a well-established phenomenon with no plans to disappear any time in the future. The shows being released now are, in my opinion, the best anime has ever been. Make sure to support the animators and manga artists by buying their products. Well, that was the history of anime. After watching this video, you know about the first animes, the first notable figures in anime, big turning points in anime, and a lot more as long as you paid attention or as long as I didn't talk too fast. Remember to comment if you liked the video, subscribe, and as always, Thank you guys so much for watching.